Okay, so Keno Sullivan, an eight-time All-Ireland winner with Dublin, joins us now as part of the AirGrid timing sponsorship launch. AirGrid, Ireland's grid operator, is now in its seventh year as the official timing partner of the GEA. Uh, Keen, how are you getting on? Good. Good, thanks. Um, yeah, I can't complain. Get busy. We are talking here on what is a, a pretty glorious Tuesday afternoon. Croke Park sees its first taste of football championship action this weekend. Is this the first time you thought to yourself, God, I'd, I'd love to be back in there? Ah, yeah, there's always a little bit of you that's uh, yearning to play. Like, it's funny, these are the... <laughs> you'd like to miss all the drudge and toil of training in winter and all the fitness and mass tests, tests that go with getting ready for this point and just leapfrog straight into a game. That'd be nice, but it doesn't work that way. But yeah, look, at it. I only hung up the boots last summer, so uh, the bug hasn't hasn't fully left me yet. But. I presume then you don't miss that fitness work and that drudge, as you refer to it there, at all? Uh, no, no, like I actually <laughs> didn't, I didn't mind that too much, to be honest. Um, but yeah, no, moved on to a, a new phase in my life. Um, even if I wanted to keep doing it, I think the body just, <clears throat> the body wouldn't be up to it. So um, yeah, we had we had uh, a, a new arrival there 10 weeks ago. And uh, oh, congratulations. We just, yeah, recently moved house and all that stuff. So I uh, kept mighty busy. I thought when I finished playing football, I'd have all this free time on my hands. I was wondering <laughs> what I was going to do. I was like, oh, I play a little bit of golf. I mean, you know, but I have less free time on my hands now than I've ever had. So, um, yeah, even the thoughts of playing football, I'm like, Janie, I don't know where I would squeeze that <laughs> in. Maybe uh, give it 20 years or so and you'll finally get the, the clubs back out. Uh, that That's a, like, it's an interesting kind of departure from the scene that you had where Obviously, as you say, there it was it was the body that eventually gave in. It, it did feel at the end of your career that there was still very much a contribution, maybe even just from the bench that you could have made to the Dublin team, which is in a little bit of contrast to maybe some of the other teammates who departed over the last couple of years, where the next batch of players coming through were just so good they couldn't get in and actually get minutes off the bench. Like, was there a slight frustration about that? That there was clearly a sense that you could have got some meaningful minutes as a Dublin player. Yeah, like I think injuries are always a part of my career. Um, even we had our we had a, the, the ten year anniversary. Well, sorry, it was last year, but because of COVID, we had to kick it out. Um, but we had a ten year reunion there for for the twenty eleven team at the weekend. And even looking back on that season, like I missed all of the Leinster Championship through injury. Um, I kind of forget about that. I'm like, Jesus, you know, I kind of was injury kind of played its part. No, quite squarely in, in, in my career each season. So um, I guess the difference in the last in the last two years in 2020 and 2021 was that um, I think I really just ran out of road and uh, previous years I was able to, you know, I was able to get it right for the important parts of the season. Whereas in 2020 and 2021, um, despite best efforts and, you know, I really threw the kitchen sink at it, and I'm glad that I did. Uh, I'm glad I made that decision to do that and go back and try and do it because at least that decision to step away, then you can do it with no regrets, and it's a lot easier to take. Um, but th that 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 was the difference, you know. So I I was used to dealing with injuries, but I just wasn't used to not not playing anything, you know, because of them. Um, so that was hard. That was that was definitely challenge in, 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 in the last two years, in 2020 and 2021, yeah. The relationship that you have with injuries also kind of led to this uh, cloud of uncertainty for opposing teams, it felt sometimes. Like, I mean, the 2015 All-Ireland, am I right in saying that was the year where there were, it was up in the air whether or not you'd play, and I presume from your perspective it was quite a late decision that you would actually play that All-Ireland final? Yeah, yeah, that was like, you know, when I look back on my career, I was, you know, I was looking at one of my highlights is probably that that game just personally um because we played mayo in a semi-final replay there was only two week turnaround to the final as opposed to the usual three week turnaround and literally the last kick of the game and i tore the hamstring bloody get grade three tear in my hamstring and it was kind of like okay look 
you know, straight away I got the scan. They're like, look, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna play in the final, unfortunately. Give it a lash, you know, if you want to try, try, but it's not, it's not, it's not gonna happen. And then, whatever way the body responded, and you know, kind of ate, slept, drank, recovery for those two weeks, and um, yeah, managed to get on the pitch, managed to play, and got like 60 minutes out of it, and um, that was just. You know, to to face that adversity and then like to get on the pitch was one thing, and then to actually win the game um, and to play it, you know, 50 minutes or whatever it was, that was really really rewarding. You know, that was that was a really really special moment for me. Yeah. I hadn't realised there was a hamstring tear uh, in the space of two weeks. That doesn't happen too often. That level of recovery. Yeah, it was bananas. It was bananas. I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah, just uh, just doing everything to try and get it right. You know, and um, yeah. Whatever, whatever I did worked. So yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty rewarding. Yeah. That time in uh, the, I guess the, the lifespan of, of your Dublin team is is a really interesting time because uh, I guess 2015 was the year you had kind of discovered, like, not discovered, but Rory O'Carroll had started to to nail down the full back position. A- any questions around Dublin's defence seem to have been fixed almost in in 2015. Obviously, uh, Rory, the, the parts and scene after that and the questions kind of come back up. And it feels that after that point, your role as a sweeper in the Dublin defence kind of went to a whole other level. Is that fair to say? Or, or, or when for you was the first time when you, saw, when you thought to yourself, right, me as the anchor point of this defence, this is a really, really important role that I fulfil? Yeah, like there was never a eureka moment. Um, like it was always slow to say that you know we play a sweeper role. Um, I think our view was that if we had a spare man um, in the backs, well, let's make let's make use of that and let's try and make me that player. Um, if teams wanted to go man and man and six up. We'll go six up all day. Thanks very much. Um, but the style of play at the time wasn't that. There was always one or two wing forwards dropping back to try and, you know, shore up their defence against our attack, who were pretty formidable. So um, yeah, that that inevitably left us with one man, and I guess one extra man, and as po- as opposed to playing that that high court press, all out attack, um, which. You know, probably came unstuck in 2014. Said, "All right, let's let's look at this a different way and um, make sure we have a pretty resilient a resilient uh, <coughs> defensive structure." And I kind of just naturally started to slip into that that piece of the jigsaw, um, and I was I was happy to do so and felt 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 comfortable with that role. Whose decision was it? Was it just one night in training? Jim Gavin said, listen, you're going to be the spare man and, and to hang back, or or how does that decision get made? No, I think I think it was over the course of a number of years. You know, I remember even under Pat Gilroy playing a bit of a sweeper role at times, um, depending on the opposition and whatever tactics we were trying to employ at the time. And it was and even in early in my career, like I kind of played up. Or even under like 15, I played corner forward and like Dublin development squads, which is just bananas. I can <laughs> kick the scores, but uh, I don't know. I don't know, maybe because I've played so many different positions, I kind of just had a bit of a more rounded experience of of of, of playing that that role, um, and it suited me, and I I enjoyed it and I felt comfortable in it. Um, but there was never like a watershed moment or a meeting where we said, okay, look, this is what we're going to do. This is the master plan. And this is how we're going to tackle the next six games. And we're going to have this as a key, a key anchor of our, of our defensive strategy. It just kind of took on a life of its own, really. Um, you know, you said that you felt immediately comfortable in that position and quite often what people said about you in that role was just the ability to read the game, uh, kind of like people would talk about Seamus Moynihan and his ability to read the game. I, I presume that it's just a hard thing to uh, quantify in your head or, or, or a hard thing to put down to a skill set or how you actually practice that. I presume anyway it, it was all instinctive, or was it? Yeah, like so people who would uh, give credit for it would, 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 would say they had it's an, an instinctive and it's a great reading of the game. Other people would just see it as sitting there marking space, <laughs> and not doing much. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah, like, I think, yeah, I think the, the, the key, it was always about uh, identifying the threats, you know, what was, and, and trying to cut them out and negate them. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's a running, if it's a running game that a team's playing, all right, well, you're going to have to expect yourself to step out of that six and meet the on-runner. If it's a more traditional kicking game like a carry, well, then, you know, as soon as the ball meets, meets that middle third where they can foreseeably kick it into our full forward line okay well how can i how can i position myself to to cut out an option limit their options coming in so i guess you're you're kind of reading the game the transition the opposition's transition as it's developing as to what kind of attack that they have and you're also probably reading body positions and body language of players you know are they running it? Are they shaping up to, to kick it? You know, having a good familiarity of players as well. You know, who likes to link in with who? Crossfield balls, high balls. If Donahue's inside for Kerry, you know, you need to be a little tighter into your full back line if they're going to hit a big long range and boomer ball in. Whereas if it's, if it was a James Donahue or a Gooch, it's more likely a, you know, a crossfield low trajectory ball that you might can step out a little bit from to try and cut it out so um yeah it was never it was, yeah it was probably a, a reading of opposition players and their transitions and then you're just you're just cutting out cutting out options i must say that does sound slightly instinctive but it also sounds like you did a hell of a lot of hard work in terms of identifying threats watching tape and knowing exactly the the information that you kind of just described there over the last couple of minutes, what an opposition attack likes to do. Not 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 massively either. Like you're playing these teams quite regularly as well, so you build up a fairly organic knowledge or bank of knowledge on 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 the on the players just through, and that's probably the best experience, you know. You can mm. sit in front of a break and write down notes on a on an A4 pad, and then as soon as you go into the pitch, you, you couldn't recite one of the points that you've written. Down. So, um, I think just that that that, and it you know it was those it was, it was kind of familiar faces that we were facing the whole time, and the Mayos, the Kerrys, and the Tyrones. Um So yeah, there was probably there was a build up of of, of style. Just very interesting experience. Uh, one of the other things I, I wanted to ask you about is um, this this notion that you've walked away now with um, eight All Ireland medals, uh, joint at the the very top of the leaderboard. Are you hoping now that uh, Michael Fitzsimons and James McCarthy just decide to ride off into the sunset before this year is done? Oh man, I, I get sleepless nights thinking about them walking <laughs> up the steps of the hope. No, of course not. Jesus, no. Like there's there's guys. That's I was I was incredibly fortunate. Like there's nothing special about me that I managed to have eight all Irelands. I was just lucky to have been. I was lucky I was born in 1988 uh, and to have been my playing career straddled 2011 to 2020. Um, other players who've played for Dublin um, weren't as lucky. You know, Kieran Whelan is the often cited example of, of someone who I think he started in 96 and did he finish in 2010 or 2009. So he just like straddled the barren period uh, and won no All Ireland's. Um, yet he's, you know, go down as one of the the county's greatest players. So um, yeah, no, like that's that's not something I would pay much heed to. You say it's uh, luck, but at the same time, um, I guess the time frame wasn't necessarily just 2011 to 2020. It, it was. 2009 to, to 2020 and if I'm not mistaken I think you come into the All-Ireland quarter final in 09 against Kerry after 25 minutes half an hour when the game looked lost already so that I'd assume in one of your first championship experiences in the Blue of Dublin is a massive moment in your career as well for what comes after yeah yeah it definitely was like that was a very humbling slash you know confidence beating um experience um you know i was i was thrilled to get my debut for dublin in an all-around quarterfinal oh that was your first Kerry. appearance in a championship is it 
Well, I play. I came on as a blood sub against Kildare right. in, the, in the Leicester final for a couple of minutes. Um, but my first like proper spell of play was against Kerry in that semi in that quarter final. The game was already lost when I came on, really. Now, to be wow. honest. Um, but yeah, like even you know, there was a lot of criticism level at the team. It was Pat's first year, and um, the future didn't look that bright at all in the immediate aftermath of that game. You know, we were the startled airwigs. Um, but then you fast forward two years later and we've won in all Ireland. So um, it was really amazing to think how much of a turn around was performed on that team in that period. It's a massive credit due to, to Pat Gilroy and Mickey Whelan for um, the stranglehold they took over that Dublin football, senior football team and the cultural change that they bought about in that, in that team. Um, which I think was the foundation for what Jim took over and then just morphed into something completely, you know, beyond what I ever thought it might be when I started out in 2009, yeah. Was there anything that was done in particular with relation to you over the course of those couple of years between 09 and 11 that rebuilt that confidence that you say might have been a little bit damaged after 09? I think for me personally, um, Croaks were going through a really good spell at the time. Um, we'd won in all Ireland in 2009. We won another jump, Dublin Championship in 2010, I think, and got beaten in a, in a semi final um, that year against Cross McGlenn. So we were going, we were going really well, and I was playing good football and enjoying it. Um, so I think personally for me, um, that that was. Um, my, I got my confidence through that. And then I think, you know, it was back to ground zero with, with Dublin in 2010. There's a real emphasis put on the league and even the O'Brien Cup. You know, actually, we, we had our 10-year reunion in 2011 there. And uh, the season of Sunday's publication was um, given out to, to all the players. And I was just flicking back through it. And, you know, you see, like, Mick McCauley was talking out for a Burn Cup games and Bernard Brogan. And, you know, we had, you know, some of our top players playing in in that early stage competition, which is, you know, used as a Dublin's kind of second slash third team, you know, to try and blood some new players now. So it was really back to ground zero and to, to build from the bottom up. I think confidence slowly started to come back into the team with, with I think we got to um do we get to a league final or we had good league campaigns anyway. Um so yeah. In two thousand and ten, you know, two thousand and ten we got to an all Ireland semi final and we were beaten by Cork who went on and won it. There was a great Cork team that year. Um so we weren't that far off it. We knew we weren't that far off it. Yeah, and we all know what happened next. Just one very quick one before you let you go, Keen, just on the the Dublin setup this year, you talk about uh coming back from that uh, confidence denting experience in 09. I'm not sure there was any confidence dented after the league campaign this year at Dublin, but it definitely looked like a bit of an angry performance against Wexford. It definitely looks like you're not going to take any prisoners during this year's Leinster Championship. No, I think I, 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 I've, I'm very optimistic in Dublin's, Dublin's chances this year. Like I look at, I look down to the team sheet and I look at some of the form that players were hitting against Wexford and some of the players that are really integrating back into the team that need three or four games under their belt to, to you know really be at their at their zenith. So um I I think they have great chances this year and I'm quietly optimistic. I know the league campaign um wasn't what the, I'm sure that they had planned for, but what I liked about the approach that was taken was, was obviously a very much a long-term vision there for this team, and, and Desi isn't looking for um, a just one-off success. He's looking to build a sustainable, um, a, something sustainable for the next number of years, and if that meant sacrificing a league or a couple of league games to blood new players that needed to, that needed to come into the squad, he's willing to do that. So uh, for me, that's very encouraging. Um, and I still look at the core of that team and, you know, 
I think it's going to take a really, really, really strong team to stop them. Yeah, and a couple of them will get to that magic nine if things go well for them this year, yeah. potentially beyond, uh, which is obviously the most important thing. Keno Sullivan, just the eight All Irelands uh, for him uh, with Dublin, of course. He was with us as part of the Airgrid Timing Sponsorship launch. Airgrid Ireland's grid operator is now in its seventh year as the official timing partner of the GEA.